The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, Steve Pakin's 2021 conversation with Alan Cross. Last century, as in the 1990s, if you wanted to hear your new favorite song, you'd grab the CD and seamlessly skip to the track you wanted. It felt luxuriously easy and portable compared to everything before, especially cassette tapes. Then a little invention from Apple came along that literally put hundreds of songs at your fingertips. Launched 20 years ago, the iPod transformed music listening forever. Alan Cross is the host of The Ongoing History of New Music on 102.1 The Edge and is co-author of the new book, The Science of Song, How and Why We Make Music. This year also marks his 40th year on the radio and we're pleased to welcome him back to our airwaves from the downtown of Ontario's capital city for the long view on all of this. Alan, first of all, my goodness, 40 years. Congratulations. That's a hell of an achievement, my friend. Well done. Well, thank you. I had no expectations when I started doing this that I would still be doing it 40 years later. But uh, I have no other personal or portable skills, so I guess this is uh, this is my lot. <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, let's go back uh, not too long ago, a couple of months ago. It was October 23rd, actually, 2001, uh, that the iPod debuted. That anniversary came and that anniversary left without a heck of a lot of fanfare. How come? Because Apple is a forward-looking company, they don't really tend to spend a lot of time looking on the history of products that really don't matter anymore. I mean, they will forever sing the praises of the first Macintosh computer that came out in 1984, uh, and they will probably talk about... Uh, well, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> but the whole idea is that they're, they're moving forward. The, the iPod enjoyed a very, very big... Uh, uh, period of, of, of popularity and then the iPhone came along it basically ate its lunch it cannibalized most iPod sales and now there's only one uh, model available and that's the iPod touch which is essentially an iPhone without a phone and it is uh, they don't even break out the numbers now when they give their quarterly reports it's just part of other hardware I well, we do like to look back on this program, so we are going to look back 20 years ago, and the world got introduced to the iPod with a commercial that, as the kids say, looked a little something like this. Sheldon, if you would. Now that does bring back some sweet memories there. And uh, let me ask you, uh, they were not holding protests at the corner of Young and Bloor demanding this kind of product. So why did Apple launch it in the first place? Because they wanted to get uh, first mover advantage in the marketplace beyond a couple of South Korean companies. Steve Jobs realized that Apple was in big, big trouble. He had come back to the company in the late 90s, pared down their product line, came out with the brand new, remember the, the multicolored uh, IMAX that you just pulled out of the box and plugged in and they worked? He believed that the music was a big part of Apple's uh, ecosystem and a part of their DNA. So uh, he had seen a couple of portable MP3 players that had come out of South Korea that didn't do very well and were almost legislated out of existence because there was a very big concern that this was copyright infringement, the record labels really didn't like it. Uh, and uh, what, what ended up happening is that the those devices from the South Korean companies were made uh, legal or declared legal based on a 1976 ruling uh, against Disney and Universal, who sued Sony over something called the Betamax VCR. <laughs> anyway, so if if if, the, if we were ripping songs for personal use on these devices, uh, it was no different than creating uh, videotapes of programs that you may have missed. So Steve Jobs wanted to get a, a piece of this action. He honestly believed that music was the way forward. Uh, what we learned later that this uh, device was called, codenamed the P38 Dulcimer. 
<laughs> and it was not developed entirely in-house with Apple. They bought some uh, existing hardware. They bought another company that had some of this hardware. and But they pushed it all through in about 11 months. So from start to finish, the whole iPod thing happened in, in 11 months and came out in October of 20, uh, October 23rd, uh, 2001. And at first, not a lot of people noticed because it was in the fog of 9-11. It was something that was released when everybody was still getting their you know, heads back together after that terrible day. And uh, it sold slowly at first, but everybody who got their hands on it realized that this was a magical thing that worked better than anything else out in the marketplace. And it looked cool. And uh, let's not forget the fact that they all had, you know, these white earbuds mm. or white headphones that, you know, if you, even if you had the thing under your jacket and you walked past and people saw you wearing the white earbuds, they knew uh, you had an iPod. You were on the cutting edge of things. So that was one thing that made it better than uh, some of the other MP3 players out there. What else made it superior to the competition? Well, it didn't skip uh, because what Apple had done is gone to Hitachi and bought up their entire inventory of 1.8 inch hard drives, and basically cornering the market on those tiny, tiny hard drives. And uh, based using that hardware and a system of what's called nested menus with the software, the thing just worked really, really well. They also had uh, iTunes, of course, which was at first just a, a CD ripping program. It worked seamlessly with the iPod using a, a technology called Firewire. So you could load up a thousand songs in, in mere minutes, which I, I had a couple of really early MP3 players. And uh, the quality of the audio was terrible because the, um, the, the capacity, the storage capacity was so low. And uh, you could only get maybe 30 songs or 35 songs in a, in, a, in a decent audio quality. The iPod comes along, and you get a thousand songs in your pocket, and they all sound great. Uh, and the headphones also help too. The earbuds helped too because they also sounded very, very good. And it was so easy to use. It was intuitive. Any, I remember being, you know, playing with the the first one. Um, uh, somebody at work had bought one, and it was like, whoa, this. Uh, this, I got it in 10 seconds. That, that was how remarkable it was. Now, we have to remember that this is, after all, a gizmo. It is not the actual music. It is a way of playing the music. But, of course, it was so mm -hmm. revolutionary that it did change musical trends. How so? Well, here's the big one. Uh, and you can't talk about the iPod without talking about iTunes. iTunes was presented to the record uh, industry by Steve Jobs at a time when everybody was dying because of file trading and piracy. And the record labels could not get together to do anything uh, as a group because that would have violated antitrust rules. So they needed an outside person to come in to provide a storefront digital solution for selling music this way as a way of, of you know, meeting customer demand and also as a way of combating privacy. So uh, with, with iTunes, um, what you had and originally was just something that would rip CDs. Then it became the store. And one of the things about the store was albums were, de were deconstructed into their individual tracks. Not all of them at first, but most of them. So rather than buying an entire album for whatever the price might be, $10.99, $12.99, or so on, you could buy just the songs you wanted. And this was a really big deal because if you remember back to the late 1990s, the big criticism was we were getting albums with one or two good songs on it and the rest was, was junk. At the same time, the recorded music industry was phasing out the single. So you couldn't just buy the one song that you wanted as we had been doing since the dawn of recorded music. So what we saw was Apple through iTunes using the iPod deconstructing or heralding the end of the traditional album because you no longer had to buy all those records. 
or all those uh, all those songs you didn't want. You mm-hmm. just buy the songs you wanted, and that has put us on the road to streaming, where it's not about the album anymore. It's about individual songs. That's the biggest thing that iTunes and the iPod did. I, I, I get that, and I guess that is a, a brave step forward for consumer choice, and and obviously only paying for what you want. But on the flip side, I wonder if it, I wonder if there was a downside to that, namely. When you bought the album, you might sort of accidentally bump into a song that you didn't know about, but that, as it turns out, you actually love, and it becomes part of the soundtrack of your life. There's less of a chance of that happening now. Isn't that the case? I I, I totally, completely agree. I mean, earlier this year, we had uh, a situation with Adele, who demanded that Spotify remove the shuffle option, or at least cripple the shuffle option on her album, because the whole thing was meant to be listened to in a certain order as a whole. And that has been the way it's been for for a lot of records. I mean, we think about all the concept records that we started getting in the 1960s all the way through to today. That is essentially a a little mini opera where you're supposed to follow the libretto and everything has to be unfolded in a specific order. Uh, It's it's really difficult to imagine uh, anybody making an album like Pink Floyd's The Wall or Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or even Green Day's American Idiot today because those are... Uh, pieces of art that are meant to be consumed as a whole, not by the individual tracks, which is which is one of the sad things about the demise of the album. I, I, I think we're, we're the album is still the currency of the recorded music industry, and it's still by which so many things are measured, including things like awards programs and so on. But uh, we're starting to really see the the album uh, lose currency um, in 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 favor of individual songs. You know the hip hop community has got this really figured out you you drip 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 songs out and you don't you know wait two three years between albums uh or you put out an ep or you put out a mixtape it's all about making sure that your audience is serviced on a regular and timely basis rather than the old model of you know like u2 for example who put out an album tour behind it for four years and then disappear for another two Hmm. now i can't do that anymore lps or i guess what we used to call back in the day the long play vinyl record they have made a comeback. They, they, I guess, went away for a while, but they have made a comeback, and they're kind of cool again. But I wonder whether you mm. think the iPod really put to death, if you like, cassettes and CDs and those alternate ways of playing music. Well, they, they certainly did, because uh, a cassette, it was bulky. Uh, I, I have a, a great hate for cassettes. Anybody who romanticizes and fetishizes uh, cassettes today never had to live the, the period when they melted on your dashboard or got uh, completely you know, snarled in your cassette player or you had to have a, a box of these things rattling around on the floor of your car. Uh, no, 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 thank you. Um, you also had the hassles of fast forwarding and rewinding. You didn't have the ability to skip back and forth. Um, with with uh, portable CD players, they had some buffering, so you would, you know, some of them would say that well, you could uh, you had a twenty second skip protection on it, which which meant that uh, every twenty seconds it would skip. You know, <laughs> it's essentially <laughs> what happened. Uh, and and then. Um, Vinyl LPs were, were never were never portable beyond the 1950s. Back in the 1950s, you could get something called the Highway Hi-Fi, which was actually an under-dash uh, turntable that Chrysler and DeSoto sold for a little while. Uh, but, you know, vinyl is was one of those things where uh, you have to pay attention as you're preparing to listen to it, as you're listening to it, and as you're putting it away. It is, uh, for some people, it is, uh, vinyl has become this thing where... Uh, it's proof of how much inconvenience you are willing to display to show everybody just how much more you love music than everybody else. <laughs> See, I have to I have to sit at home in front of the stereo listening to it. I have to take it off the shelf. I, if I want to skip a song, I have to get up and walk across the room. Uh, but at the same time, it's this 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 visceral thing. You have to hold it in your hands. You can look at the liner notes. You can read the lyrics. You can uh, try and you know, figure out what the artwork means. It's got a beautiful picture on the cover. Completely. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're finding is that the largest cohort of of people purchasing brand new vinyl records right now is Generation Z. But you told us earlier that, you know, once the iPhone came along, you kind of didn't really need an iPod anymore. So I guess the, the question I should ask is, is the iPod here on its 20th anniversary already obsolete? It is. Uh, if you want a dedicated, 
MP3 player, you can get one really, really cheap that works really, really well. Um, Apple is all about selling iPhones right now because that is the bread and butter of the company. And uh, frankly, you can get an iPhone for you know a couple hundred dollars, which was far, far less than what you would have to pay for an original iPhone uh, back in 2001. And you know that I think it was $599 Canadian, and that's in 2001 dollars. So uh, you know, get an iPhone phone and just don't use the just don't put a sim card in it i mean that's that's really what it what it comes down to mm -hmm. uh i we've got about five minutes and change left and i want to take advantage of the fact that you are here um mm. a, as one of the truly great radio personalities uh, observers of the music scene in canadian music history in radio history uh, as we said off the top 40 years in the business now can I just ask you what got you? I know you made this joke about no other, you know, transferable skills to anything else. But the fact of the matter is, you really have found your lane. But how did you start out in that lane and know that it was going to be radio for you in the first place? My grandmother gave me a transistor radio, a Lloyd's five transistor transistor radio for my birthday, my sixth birthday. And my parents didn't ask her to give me one. I didn't ask for one. She, there's no reason for her to give me one. But yet, I, I, this was my first exposure to my own program. I could choose my own programming. Because up until that point, I could only listen to whatever mom and dad listened to from the radio on the kitchen counter or in the car. With my own little radio, I was free to discover all this audio, all this entertainment, all this news, all this information coming from somewhere. And I found it absolutely magical. And it, from the moment I got that radio, I, we, I was inseparable. Um, I would put it on my pillow listening to music, falling asleep, and my mom would have to come and turn it off and, and put it on, on the uh, on the nightstand. Uh, that was really it. I decided that I wanted to do something that brought this weird connection from out of the ether to, to, to people. Um, I, I would pester my dad. We would go to our radio stations. If somebody was doing a remote at a, funer uh, at a furniture store, I would insist that we stop and watch the guy do his, his live commercial. It just became something I, I had in mind. Uh, from age six. That's amazing. And uh, I know it's called 102.1 The Edge today, but I guess when you got there, it was called CFNY, and it was the alternative mm -hmm. voice of radio. How'd you end up there? Uh, very. I had a fight with my program director in Winnipeg. We, I decided that we weren't getting along, so I started blindly applying to radio stations across the country to get out of that particular position. And uh, the last place I applied to with CFNY, and I had, I didn't know much about the radio station, I didn't know much about the music, I just knew that it was near Toronto, it was based in Brampton at the time, and that I had to get out. And uh, I never heard from any of those other radio stations, and five days later I was hired, uh, and appeared, I, I drove up and got to reception on October 3rd, 1986, at 12 noon, the exact moment that they had the sod turning ceremony for the construction of the Sky Dome. So I am as old as the Sky Dome in Toronto. <laughs> okay. Um, that's pretty cool. Y you know, you think about that, that probably can't happen today, right? <sighs> no. I, 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 everything has, has changed so much about media in general, radio specifically. Radio used to be one of the only games in town. Now there's so many other things that people are occupying their time with. Uh, but radio, let's be very clear, is still very powerful, very profitable, uh, and very popular. I mean, more than 85% uh, of the Canadian population listens to radio every week. It's still the, th the main thing that we listen to in the car. So it is a, uh, a very powerful medium still. It does have to evolve with the digital age, but because it's working well, and because we have to evolve at the same time as we're doing a good job, it's kind of like changing the wings on an airplane flying at 38,000 feet. Hmm. We got to do it. It's just going to be tricky. Yeah. Let me get back to you. So, 19 in the 1980s, you get to CFNY. 1993, you create this show, the ongoing history of new music. What What did you imagine the mission of that show to be when you created it? I didn't create it. I was forced to do it. Hmm. I the, we had new management at the time, and uh, they were thinking about changing the radio station over to country. But then they realized that there was, you know, these bands uh, like Pearl Jam and, and Soundgarden and Nirvana and Red Hot Chili Peppers and so on. Uh, okay, we're going to stick with this music, but we really need to educate the audience about what we're doing. So the best way to do that, and back in the day we had to have all these regulation 
required programs called foreground music programming. The idea was that we're going we're gonna to create a, a one-hour documentary that's going to explain to our new listeners and our old listeners what this music is all about. So they looked around the staff and they found exactly one person with a history degree, me, <laughs> and they assigned it to me. And I said, I, I don't want to do it because I was happy playing records in the afternoon. I was working from two until six every day. And it was fantastic. Uh, but they said, no, you're going to do it or we'll, you know, give you a nice little package and you can find something else to do. Now, I had just been married. I had just built a house. Uh, I had to do something. So I accepted the their offer. <laughs> and uh, a- after one program, they when they listened to it and saw what I was going to do with it, uh, they just left me alone. And um, I'm currently writing program number 947. Unbelievable. It's almost 30 years. You're still going strong. Good for you. We've got about a a minute and a half to go here, and I do want to ask you about the science of song, how and why we make music. This is a new book that you've got out. What are you trying to achieve with this? A couple of years ago, I did a, I was part of a traveling science museum exhibit called the Science of Rock and Roll. We were at the Ontario Science Center for about six months, and we toured to some other places. And when this was all over, I had all this research, and I thought, well, I just can't let this go. I mean, the, the exhibit's over, but there's all this good stuff here. And while the exhibit was on, no matter where we went, and we were in Kansas City and Detroit and a bunch of other places, I saw a lot of kids really, really getting involved in in the displays. So I thought, well, why don't we turn this into a kid's book? And uh, I work for my main client is Chorus Entertainment. They have a division called Kids Can Press, which is a, a fantastic children's publishing uh, division. And uh, we, I said, hey, we want to do this? And they said, okay. So uh, I gave them a couple of manuscripts, and then they gave me some help because I apparently don't really speak child very well. Uh, So they translated it a bit, and uh, this is the result. came out on September the 7th and apparently is doing quite well. We wish you well with that. We wish you continued success with the ongoing history of new music. We congratulate you on 40 years on the radio, and Alan, we're always delighted when you appear on TVO. Alan Cross, thanks so much again. Glad to be here. Thanks, Steve. It's been 80 years since the first traditional style comic book was published here in Canada. A Hamilton historian is among those helping an effort to mark the occasion. Justin Chandler covers the Hamilton Niagara region for Ontario Hubs, and he joins us from Hamilton with the fine print on that. Hey, Justin. Hey there. All right, Justin, with a Twitter handle handle, like Mr. Lois Lane, it was only a matter (laughs) of time before we started talking about comic books. And of course, for people who are not familiar, uh, your Twitter handle is sort of a tribute to Lois Lane, a fictional character in the Superman comics. Superman's love interest, but more importantly, an award-winning journalist. So very fitting. Exactly. Uh, but we're going to be talking about Canadian comics today. Uh, a little known, uh, a little, uh, not much is known about its history. So maybe get us started. What do we need to know? So this period that we're talking about, uh, wartime Canadian comics, really started, like you said, in 1941. And the reason for this, as the reason for many things in Canada, is because of uh, bureaucratic, essentially. So during the war there was uh, this act called the War Exchange Conservation Act that banned the import of non-essential goods. And included in those were pulp magazines and comic books. So suddenly the American comic books like Superman and Batman that had really started kicking things off in 1939 uh, were no longer available to Canadian kids. So what that meant was that Canadian publishers had an opportunity and almost right away they started making books. So by 1941, the first Canadian traditional style floppy comic uh, was published. And when I say floppy style, I mean kind of like this. So a traditional, like what you think of as a book now that it's Ben's, not the first comic, but the first in that style that we all know and love today. Now I understand these comics are very rare to find now. Uh, I wanna pull a cover of the better comic number one. Tell us about this. So Better Comics number one, this was where it started. This was the first book, with the cover date of March 1st, 1941. Um, it was created by a publisher in BC. His name was Vernon Miller and uh, his publishing company was called Maple Leaf. And it was a story that included uh, some interesting um, characters like the superhero Iron Man, not the Iron Man that you might know Um, from Marvel today, but this Iron Man who was like an ocean-dwelling superhero who fought Nazis in crime. 
um, and as well just some other anthology stories. So it was also uh, notably mostly in black and white. And that was actually the case with most of these wartime comic books that started coming after that because it was a lot cheaper to print. Now, I'm sure there are going to be some comic book collectors who are watching this who are like, okay, wait, hold on. How do I get my hands on them? And I'm just curious, is there sort of a, a, a price tag on these comics as well? That's hard to say. I don't know about how much they would actually go for if you were able to buy one because they are so hard to find. Like the, the comic book historian that I talked to um, to learn about all of this, Ivan Kukmarek, what he was telling me was that with some of these books, there's fewer than 10 in existence. And because the, the industry came and went so fast, like after the war, when American books started coming in, all these Canadian publishers folded. So in some cases, there's fewer than 10 of any of these books in existence, and people didn't really save them in the same way or even know about them. So they're rare, but they're not, they don't have the same prestige as a 1940s Batman or Superman comic might. Now, I understand Ivan's sort of taken it upon himself to preserve this rare moment in Canadian comic book history. Tell us about that. Yes, he says it's his mission to teach more people about uh, these wartime comics. And so part of what he's trying to do um, is actually to reprint better comics, number one, in sort of a collector's format. And so he says he's in touch with uh, the family um, of Vernon Miller, who, who's the one who published the book, and with some archives. And basically, he's trying to get access and um, put this book out uh, to the world so that people can read it again. Now, I understand there is a society called the Society for the Promotion of Canadian Comics, who are they and how else is Ivan and, and that organization trying to preserve this legacy? So this is a collection of comic book enthusiasts and academics. Um, Ivan's a member of the group and they're working in order to try and uh, teach more people about these, this history and to just promote Canadian comics more generally. And so part of an effort for that is, uh, for example, they worked on a magazine um, sequential Canadian Independent Comics Magazine is a book that publishes information about indie comics in Canada. They did a special history issue as part of this effort, and they're also working towards an academic conference. I, I do want to end off on this one question. Now, of course, we all know that you, you know, Justin is pretty synonymous to comics. That's how that's how I know you. Uh, but did you know about this Canadian history uh, before, or uh, is this also your uh, your mission to uh, preserve this legacy as well? Yeah, this was all new to me. So I'm, I'm very excited to be telling more people about this. I, I do consider myself maybe an amateur comics historian, but most of what I know about is the American comics. Um, and despite doing a lot of uh, modern reporting on Canadian comics and people making books today, I didn't know about this 1940s history. And I, I'm very glad that I do now. Well, Justin, I want to thank you so much for that history on Canadian literacy and comics. Appreciate it. Thank you. Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.